This video will follow the restoration of our 16-foot Rushton Indian Girl canoe, which dates from around 1906. John Henry Rushton began building small boats in Canton, New York around 1873. His company and the boats he built are well documented. I will only touch on the high spots here. Detailed information can be found in two books, Rushton and His Times in American Canoeing by Atwood Manley and Boats and Boating in the Adirondacks by Haley Bond of the Adirondack Museum. There are also two catalog reprints, Rushton Rowboats and Canoes, 1903 by William Crowley and Rushton Canvas Covered Canoes, 1910, reprinted by the Wooden Canoe Heritage Association. Daniel Miller also wrote a three-part series on Rushton that is published in the Wooden Canoe Journal beginning in February 2011. Rushton himself was born October 9, 1843, and he died April 1, 1906. He died of Bright's disease, which nowadays we would know as kidney disease. He also had heart disease and high blood pressure. He was only 62. He is buried in the Fairview Cemetery in Canton, New York. Rushton introduced the Indian Girl Canoe in 1902 because he was losing so much business to the other builders. His all wood canoes were significantly higher in price than the canvas covered canoes and the always price conscious public wanted a lower priced canoe. The canoes were built by a contract crew, not by employees of the boat shop. The contractors were headed up by Melvin Roundy, an experienced canoe builder from Maine, followed by Frank Fox after 1908. They were paid per boat, not hourly. Rushton's Indian Girl canoes were built over a solid form. The stems were made out of white elm. The ribs were two and a half inches wide and they were tapered at the inwheel and pocketed. The planking was 3 sixteenths of an inch thick and it was planed only on one side. The outside of the boat, the planking was not planed. The inwheels were one inch square cherry. The planking was three inches wide on each side of the center line and the balance of the planking was two and a half inches wide, except the sheer strake, which is on this boat, six inches wide. The stern seat is trapezoid in shape and it's hung from the inwheels. The bow seat is mounted on cleats with screws through the planking and four ribs. The seats are made out of simple rectangular cherry stock. This canoe was listed for sale on Craigslist in New York City. It had been used as a prop in at least one play, Hiawatha. That's why the canvas was painted up to look like a birch bark canoe. The seller did not know it was a Rushton, but because of the shape of the decks, wide shear strake, and the design of the seats, we suspected that it was a Rushton. It had three thwarts, only the one nearest the stern seat was original. It had 24 broken ribs, most of them massively broken. It had a long carriage bolt through the canoe behind the bow deck, holding it together. Neither seat was original to the canoe. Using a little stripper, the name J.H. Rushton, Canton, New York, was found on both stems, along with the serial number 3018 and the length. Unfortunately, the build records do not exist, so there is no way to accurately date the canoe. However, 1906 is about right. After Rushton died, the company was incorporated and canoes built after that date have a metal shield shaped tag on the bow deck. A small piece of canvas remained under the big carriage bolt with some green paint. I am presuming this to be the original color. Rushton offered the canoes in four different colors, moss green light, coach painters green light, brilliant green light, or Tuscan Red, which was sort of a maroon. They were furnished at no extra charge. If you wanted a different color, it would cost you another dollar. The paint on this little piece of canvas looks like moss to me. So I am presuming that this is moss green light. You can see the massively broken ribs. There is no shape on the starboard side at all. 
the ribs are nearly at 90 degrees, no curve. The rear seat, gunnels, and deck look pretty good, but after this picture was taken, all the spiders stopped holding hands and the canoe started to fall apart. At this point, I was seriously questioning the wisdom of restoring this canoe, but I did soldier on. I started stripping the interior. I used a product called Ultra Strip, sold by Jamestown Distributors. It is environmentally friendly, no smell, does not hurt your skin, and actually works. It did take several coats to get all the paint off. Two different colored greens, white, yellow, and black. I don't know what kind of paint this was, but if I could get paint to stick to my barn this good, I would be a happy man. After I was done stripping and had removed the seats and decks, I started replacing ribs. Because the starboard side was so misshapen, I needed to make a solid form for each rib. Two inch drive screws and fender washers forced the starboard side back into shape. I used the port side as a guide. I used a curved template tool sold by Woodcraft. Steve Lappy gets the credit for making this suggestion. Each rib is different, so each solid form is different. The curved template made the task much easier. I copied each port side rib and transferred the shape onto a 2x6 and cut them out with the bandsaw. I wasn't worried about the holes from the drive screws through the planking because they would be covered by the canvas and the ribs were going to be replaced anyway. With the old inwheel still in place, I replaced the ribs two at a time. I removed the forms and the broken ribs, stripped the paint from under the ribs, and sanded the planking. The new ribs were shaped, soaked for three days in water, then steamed for 20 minutes at over 200 degrees. The ribs were bent over the outside of the hull. A couple days later, I installed them into the canoe. I found it difficult because these ribs were pocketed. They have to be cut the correct length before they're installed, unlike an open gunnel canoe where the ribs can be left long and trimmed off later. I replaced 18 ribs in a row, two at a time. It took forever. A 19th rib was replaced separate from the others. No ribs were broken while being bent or while being installed. I had assumed all along that I would be able to save the inwheels. That turned out not to be the case. I wanted to save the inwheels because I knew that making the pocketed inwheels would be a lot of work. The port side I actually probably could have saved, but the starboard side was broken in several places and was beyond help. It may have been better to have replaced the inwheels before I started on the ribs. And if this canoe had had open gunnels, I might have proceeded in that manner, but I didn't. I should point out that in order to keep the canoe in a fair shape, I installed a batten on each side of the canoe and 18 gauge wires and turnbuckles in seven locations. By tightening some and loosening others, I could adjust the curve of each side. I wasn't worried about the holes through the ribs showing because they don't look any different than flinch brass tacks. After the ribs were replaced, I started on the backside rib repairs. The advantage of a backside repair is that the original rib can be saved. I have always been vexed by the ship Theseus. The ship Theseus is a philosophical question about how much of an old boat can be replaced and still be called an old boat. You can look it up yourself on Wikipedia. A simpler explanation is the story of my grandfather's axe. I inherited my grandfather's axe. I replaced the head twice and the handle three times. Is it still my grandfather's axe? My philosophy is to save as much of the original canoe as possible, hence the backside repairs. A backside repair is only possible when the broken rib is only cracked and not displaced. First, I carefully removed the planking over the cracked rib so I could replace it after the rib was repaired. I then cut a mortise into the rib about halfway through it. I glued in a spline made out of a paint stir stick. Our local Benjamin Moore paint store gives away stir sticks with each gallon of paint, and their stir sticks are hardwood in just the right thickness and width. Using a stir stick saves time. After the glue has set up completely and the clamps removed, the excess glue filed off and the planking can be reinstalled. The repaired rib is good as new and not visible. I repaired five ribs in this manner. The stems on this canoe were pretty well shot. 
split, broken, or rotted off. A common problem area with this type of boat. I needed to replace the top one third of both of them. First, using a piece of cardboard, I traced the profile of the stem. I then carefully removed enough of the planking to permit access to work. I saved the planking to reinstall. As a side note, the planking on the port side at the bow stem was short and didn't reach all the way to the leading edge. The starboard side was fine. Because the planking was short, there wasn't enough room to use the copper nails employed elsewhere. They used light gauge steel nails that extended through the planking and the stem and the planking on the opposite side and then simply were bent over. There's no indication that this was a repair done years later after the canoe left the factory. It was original to the boat. The stems on this canoe are fairly light, a half inch wide on the inside and a quarter inch wide on the outside or the leading edge. The original stems were supposed to have been made of elm. My replacement tip is going to be white oak simply because that's what I have on hand. I ran the stock through the planer until it was a half inch thick, same dimension as the back of the stem. I traced the stem profile onto the wood using the cardboard template and I cut it out on a bandsaw. I then attached a block of wood so I could hold it in the vise. Using a rasp, I shaped the bevel on one side. I switched the block to the other side and shaped the other bevel. I then cut the old stem for the scarf joint using a cordless cutoff saw. Holding a new stem against the stump of the remaining stem, I traced the scarf cut location. I then cut the scarf joint on the new stock. Because the block was nice and flat, the resulting cut was square and the stem would stand nice and straight. I then cut the stem tip free from the block with the bandsaw. I was then ready to glue it all together. Clamping scarf joints can be problematic because the joint has a tendency to slide as you tighten the clamp. To solve that problem, oftentimes a wooden dowel is used through the joint. However, because this stem is so light, there was no room for a dowel. I elected to use a steel nail as a pin in a pre-drilled hole through the joint. After the glue dried, I trimmed off the pin. It remains in place. I then fashioned a thin piece of wood a half inch wide and glued it and clamped it across the joint, extending well above and below the scarf joint on the back of the stem. That completed the stem repair. After the new inwells were installed, the joint at the top of the stem could be completed and the planking reinstalled. Today I want to look at the uh, at replacing the inwells. Now the inwells on Rushton Indian Girl canoes were pocketed so that the ribs would join in a little pocket in the inwale. And the inwales had this rabbit on the side of it which covered up the planking and the uh, canvas. And then the outwale went on and made it up against the inwale so that there's no gap. It's a, a closed gunnel system or a double gunnel. Uh, there's another name for it. Uh, this is a piece of the in whale. I cut the end of it off and you can see the rabbit on the side is not at 90 degrees to the uh, to the rest of it. The in whale is about an inch or seven eighths of an inch tall and about an inch wide. And when the rib sits in there, you can see that it's not at 90 degrees. It has a slight uh, angle, about seven degrees. And uh, the way I'm going to make these in whales is to run the square in whale stock through the table saw a couple times, set at that seven degree angle and cut that mortise. This is a piece of the new one that I just made.
Now that I've got the in wheels bent, I clamped them onto the uh, canoe and I have to mark the location of the rib tops so that I can cut the mortise. The mortise on the original in wheels was drilled with a Forstner bit like this one in a couple locations and then the uh, the web in between the two holes was cut out with a chisel. You can you can actually see the the tool mark from the guy that did it originally. All right, I set up a little jig for the drill press so that I can take the in whale and just slide it along to get to the different locations for the rib top mortises need to be cut. And I set it up at the same seven degree angle so that when I drill it, the cut will be vertical or parallel with this vertical face. That way the rib will mate up correctly. After all the rib top mortises were cut on the drill press, it was necessary to cut by hand several of the mortises on each of the bent ends. Because of the bend, the drill press could not be used. Dry fitting and adjusting the location and depth of some mortises was necessary to get the in wheels to seat correctly. On this canoe, the in wheels taper as they approach and pass the decks. They taper from a full width of an inch to about three eighths of an inch at the stem. I marked the taper with a straight edge and with the in wheel clamped down to the bench, cut the taper with a plane. I know some people cut these tapers on a bandsaw or a table saw, but I've always felt that spectacular mistakes can be made very quickly with power tools. At this point, I had invested quite a bit of time making these in wheels, and I didn't want to screw it up. I used a hand plane. After all four pieces were tapered and fitted, I turned to the splice joint. I clamped the first half in place and determined where I wanted the splice and marked it. I then removed it from the canoe and clamped it to the bench and cut the scarf with a stiff back saw and a Japanese pull saw. I then reclamped it into the canoe and positioned the other half of the in whale and marked the scarf on it, taking care to align the center marks I had previously penciled on. I then cut the scarf in like manner to the first cut. Some minor file work was necessary to make the joint seamless. It was glued and clamped in place until dry. The opposite in whale was completed in the same manner. Having never done it before, I was pleased how the joints turned out. The in whales were then ready to be installed in the canoe. Ring nails through each rib top with pilot holes were used in the conventional manner. I then could turn to the in whale stem connection. All right, I wanted to point out how the stem in whale connection was made, at least on this Indian girl. The end of the stem has a tenon that was cut uh, onto the top of the stem and then the two in whales would come across and capture that tenon in uh, little mortises, half a, half a mortise on each in whale. You can see here that the remnants of the, of the uh, tenon that would have stuck up. It, it was made in the same profile as the stem itself. It was just cut along the sides for the, for the two in whales. This is a little piece of planking that's still left on here. Okay, so here's the stem in whale connection finished. You can see the end of the uh, stem where it's sticking up in between here, captured by the two uh, in whales. Now, I may be universally condemned for using a little bit of glue on this, but uh, the three pieces are so light that I felt that was the best way of doing it. The person that may condemn me or curse me the most is a guy 75 years from now who uh, uh, rebuilds this boat again. But the way I looked at it, because this canoe was almost dragged over to the burn pile, uh, almost anything I do is acceptable. Now I'm gonna use a stain or two stains that is really darker than I really would like, but the reason is because despite my best efforts of stripping the paint out of this boat, there are still little specks of uh, green paint stuck in little divots and cracks and gouges that despite my best effort, I couldn't get out. Now with a darker stain, that'll help cover that up. Now we have the old ribs, the new ribs, the old planking and new planking. 
all of which has got to be stained uh, to try to match. So I'll have to use two different stains uh, on the old wood and the, uh, and the new wood. I'm going to use a, a foam brush. Now, the reason is because the brush is stiff enough that you can get in between uh, the ribs uh, with a different color than what you would use on the on the on the rib. Now, I would normally use a bristle brush. I think God intended all paint and varnish to be applied with a bristle brush. It's in the Bible someplace, I'm sure of it. And I'd be maybe risking eternal damnation to use a foam brush, but I'm going to use it anyway. I've done some experimenting with the stains for the interior of the canoe. I've settled on golden pecan for the existing wood, the old wood, because the old wood and the new wood uh, are going to stain differently and I have to use two different stains. I always have used the Minwax pre-stained wood conditioner, which helps even out the color on, uh, on the wood. That's regardless of what I'm working on, whether it's a canoe or trimming the house or whatever. The pre-stained conditioner uh, does work and it helps. Okay, I just finished with the stain. Old rib, new rib, old planking, new planking. It matches pretty good, not perfect, but you're never gonna get it perfect. As long as uh, there's no stark difference between the old wood and the new wood, I think you're pretty good shape. All right, so I have to make a, a floor rack for this canoe. It had one originally. It's made out of six longitudinal strips uh, out of ash. Uh, it's made not unlike uh, the floor racks made by Old Town and other companies. Um, it, it, it starts just forward of the end of the stem and extends, of course, to full length. There are cross pieces, five of them, one at each end, one right behind the stem here, one in the center, and then two uh, at, the, at the quarters. Now, these cross pieces, of course, it has to be bent so that the rack will lay uh, tight against the floor. The floor rack was held in place by turnbuckles, one at each end, fastened in right here at the end of the, uh, the, end of the stem. Now, these are covered with green paint, same as everything else in the boat, so I have to clean them up. But uh, there's nothing in the center of the boat to hold the rack down. Um, especially with this boat, because there's no keel, it doesn't give you the opportunity to put a block on the floor of the boat with a screw that goes right on down through with a uh, turnbuckle. So, I haven't quite decided, but I think I may put a block in the center of the boat anyway, but with screws from the outside uh, in. That would hold the block in place. But it would work, and it would give me a little more security on the rack, especially when you're driving down the road and the boat's on top of the car at 70 miles an hour. You don't have to worry about the rack coming loose. I made the cross pieces and then uh, boiled them in some hot water for like 20 minutes and then clamped them to the table, uh, bent in the uh, shape that I wanted. I used, I made a cardboard template for the, uh, from, the, from the boat. The, this is the center one and these two are the quarter uh, pieces. Now the ones on the end, because they bend uh, a lot more than the others, I made myself a uh, bending form and I did it that way. I used the metal straps in there so they wouldn't uh, so they wouldn't split. All right, so I'm working on this floor rack, and what I did was I these crossbars I bent, and this is the one for the. Uh, the quarter. They bent quite nicely and they fit nicely into the into the bottom of the canoe. Now what I'm going to do with my strips here is I'm going to space them out evenly across this uh, crossbar and fasten them in with these little brass number four screws. This is the uh, the turnbuckle it was on. The, there was two of these with the boat. They've all covered with gobs of green paint. They actually cleaned up quite nicely. The rose rose brass. And after the two ends are done, I can trim them off so that they're nice, the slats so they're nice and even. 
And then in the center of the canoe, I'm going to spread these bars apart because they'll be captured at the end and I can spread them apart so they're nice and even on this uh, center crossbar. Okay, so we're getting ready to put canvas on this canoe. I have four coats of varnish on the inside of the boat and I varnished the outside of the boat with some old varnish I had laying around to help waterproof the planking. I also added my name and the date on the outside of the canoe as well as the Bible verse, John chapter 14 verse 6. So that somebody years from now when they go to re-canvas the canoe or do some repairs, they'll find it. The canvas I bought from Northwoods Canoe Company. It's number 10 canvas, mildew resistant. Okay, so now I got this set up for uh, canvassing. I got it stretched between two uh, parts of the shop and uh, we're gonna give it a go. This is obviously the upside down method. You can do it right side up as well. I find that uh, working by myself, I can do it upside down easier. Now the way I do this is with stainless steel staples and electric staple gun. Traditionally, they would use uh, tacks, you know, uh, the brass tacks, but uh, working by yourself, and now that we have stainless steel, um, the, tack, the, the staples work real good. You start in the middle of the boat, you pull the canvas down tight, you use one of these uh, upholstery vice grips with a block of wood behind so you don't mess up the, uh, the in whale. Pull it down tight. You can see where the edge of the in whale is here, so you just staple above that. And you just go to the other side and do it over there. And you work toward each end, alternating side to side until you, can, you get down as far as you can comfortably. You pull it nice and tight. One of the advantages of this bolt with the pocketed ribs is that anywhere as you nail along here or tack or staple, you're going to hit the in well and you're going to hit something solid. If you're working with an open gunnel bolt, you, you, you have to nail or staple right through where the rib is because in between the ribs, um, there's nothing solid behind it. All right, so I've got this all stapled here as far as I can go. We're down just about to the deck. The deck is right in here. And uh, I put in two nails up at the top here uh, where, the, where, it's, where the canvas is still tight up against the keel. And I've cut off a little bit of the, cut off some of the canvas as I went along here. But you gotta be careful cutting this off because if you cut it off too high, you have really scraped the pooch. So just a word of caution, um, you need to cut it off in order to get your clamp on there as you, progress along, but just be careful you don't cut it off too high. Now I'm going to release the tension and let the, uh, take the canvas out of the clamps and then I can finish it up. All right, so I'm closing up the ends here. You pull the canvas across and run a row of tacks down. You put a little dolphinite, this stuff. There's a bedding compound in the, uh, underneath the canvas. Pull it tight, just like you were doing on the, on the sides of the canoe. And you run a, run a tack in. And you sort of work the bottom uh, as you go along to keep things nice and tight. Okay, so I got my tacks all in on this one, one side. And then you use your utility knife and you trim it right along the edge of the, uh, the edge of the stem. And then you pull the other half over and repeat the process over here. You do the same thing and then you're finished. All right, so I finished the, uh, the second half here. Came around with it, pulled it tight, top and bottom and ran a row of tacks down. Now I have to cut off the, the excess that, uh, that you don't need. And needless to say, you have to be real careful 
how you do this so you don't cut the canvas the first half that you fold it over. Otherwise, you would have screwed the pooch a second time. Okay, so I finished up the other end. So all I gotta do is trim off a few loose hairs, little loose threads, and uh, I'm ready for uh, filler. Took me all day. I don't know how fast other people do it, but it took me all day. All right, so I'm starting to put the filler on this boat. You just paint it straight on. And then you rub it in between. Go about, do about a three foot section. And rub it down with, uh, with this canvas mitt that I made. You do three coats, one right after the other. This filler came from uh, Northwood's Canoe, uh, Roland Thurlow. It's the same stuff that he uses in his shop. They make it right there. And I've had pretty good luck with it over the years. It seems to work. You have to rub it down to get it into the weave of the cloth and also to smooth it out. All right, so I got the first coat on, and I'm gonna go back to the beginning and start with the second coat. I should point out that I left the canvas long on the sides. I didn't cut it off, the whole idea being that it protects the gunnels from the filler and the paint and uh, all that. Okay, so I got three coats on, and I'll have to set the thing aside for a good three weeks while uh, while it dries. Of course, this is a linseed oil base filler and it takes that long to dry. But I got other things to do. I got to work on the seat frames and the outwales. So uh, then I can put it back together. All right, let's talk about seats and thwarts. On this canoe, when we got it, the, the two seats, both the bow seat and the stern seat, were incorrect replacements and they were pretty bad. So I had to make make new ones. Now there's a couple unique things about Rushton seats. The stern seat is uh, trapezoid in shape and it's mounted on the, uh, it's mounted below the inwheel. It's like pretty standard on most canoes. The bow seat on the other hand is mounted on cleats. This is one of the original cleats. Uh, I made new ones. They're, they're mounted on the side of the canoe with four screws from the outside. You can see it behind me on the replacement that I made. These, the seat just mounts right on the top of it. Uh, they're pretty standard, nothing too special about it. Round it on the ends, around it on the bottom, and lift flat on the top. Four screws through the seat to hold it to the cleats. Now, Russian seats were also put together with a mortise and tenon joint as opposed to dowels, where, which most companies uh, were doing, um, which, which is not hard to do on a rectangular seat. But on this trapezoid seat, with this angle, it's a little more difficult to, to accomplish. Now, Steve Lappy made and lent to me a, a little jig that he had put together for the rushed in Indian Girl reproduction that the Norm Vega chapter uh, made a few years ago. And that jig holds the, holds the uh, wood vertically at the proper angle so when you run it through the table saw it'll, it'll cut the end of the tenon on both sides. You cut the one side and then you space out the jig away from the fence a half an inch with a, with a block and that cuts the other side of the tenon. It made, made it real uh, easy and uh, came, out, came out real nice. I appreciate Steve loaning that to me. This is the original thwart. There was two thwarts in this boat. This is one of the, this is the original. It was broke off on the end, so I had to replace the glue on and, and shape up and replace the end of it here. But it's cherry. It's stamped in the center. It was quite nice to find after I stripped off the green paint. 
U.S. trademark registered Indian girl. Stamped right in here. The second thwart, I had to make a whole new one. Now, it's interesting that the, uh, I don't know whether it's by accident or design, there's a flat spot on the, on the bottom of the, of the original thwart, so I made this, did it on the new one that I made. It's flat on the bottom, but otherwise it's, it's really nice, nicely shaped. Um, it's wide, relatively thin, and uh, very nice, very nice uh, design on it. Now, when I made this, of course, working on boats, everything is on a curve and nothing's flat and straight. And it's hard to hold it in the vise. So what I did was I mounted a block the full length uh, through the holes on the end. And that was, then I was able to uh, hold it in the vise. And when I wanted to work on the other side, I could take the block off and move to the other side and then uh, work on that side. So it, it, uh, it worked well. All right, now I'm working on these uh, out whales. When I originally took the boat apart and stripped the boat, I never did anything with the out whales. And I want to reuse these, even though I have to fix the ends. Both, both ends of both out whales are, are bad. So I have to scarf in pieces on that. But I have to strip the paint off. I got the two coats of green paint off. But now there's red paint, black paint, and white paint. Apparently, gobs of green paint wasn't enough, so they had to put more on. So here I am, and I'm working. I'm working with this total boat paint remover, which uh, does work pretty good, even though it takes a while. It's supposed to be environmentally friendly. It does not stink. It does not burn out your lungs or melt your skin or uh, melt your brain. So. It does take a while, it's been on here for 24 hours, and uh, it is coming off, so wish me luck. I managed to get all the paint stripped off, two coats of green paint, black paint, red paint, white paint, and then the varnish underneath all that. So I got them cleaned up, and now I have to uh, fix the tips, all four tips. This is the stern, and this starboard side here was completely broke off. So I scarfed in a piece, a new piece uh, onto the, uh, the existing out whale. Now I took the clamps off so you can actually see it. This will pull in of course, and they're not done yet, but uh, you get the idea. I made the scarf joint, it's about four inches long. Um, that's usually about the right length that you want. Now on the other side, I needed to replace about three inches of the of the out whale. So what I did is I used a piece of the old out whale that I that was broken off, and I'm I'm using that to scarf this in uh, by using a piece of the old wood. The the color will match uh, easier. Now obviously this is not finished. I got a long ways to go with this, but uh, you get the idea. So I'm working on the bow. The bow out whales, and I used another piece of the broken out whale from the other side, and I'm making a scarf joint here, and cut it and goes together like that. Looks pretty good if I do say so myself, and uh, I'll cut it off of course, but it should uh, should clean up nicely and uh, should work. Work is continuing on these out whales. Now, on Rushton Indian Grove canoes, the out whales are attached with screws from the inside out. Now, I'm not sure why Rushton did that, whether it was, uh, he felt that it was stronger that way or it was simply aesthetics. But it does look pretty good. There's no screws showing on the outside. And also, the uh, out whales are not square across the top. They have this angle, which uh, actually looks pretty cool. All right, this is how the screws are set up. They, they go through a rib, rib tops, and, and, and then there's one in between. They're about, they're, in be, they're about five and a half to six and a half inches apart. They're not evenly spaced. They, they go through the rib and then in between. So you set it up that way. Then of course the other side you just try to match. All right, one final note on these, on these out whales. I had to make a piece almost three feet long for the 
that way on the port side. Uh, and I found it particularly challenging to make this piece. And not only is it curved, of course, which I had to bend it, um, but it's tapered vertically, it's tapered horizontally, and it has this chamfer, this bevel on the top, not to mention the, the scarf joint. Um, I don't know how fast other people work, but it took me all day to make this piece. The cover, I managed to get the new wood and the old wood to match fairly well. Um, certainly, uh, it's, it's good enough. All right, so I'm back working on these stem bands. Now, on Rushton boats and canoes, he would stamp his name in all the hardware. On stem bands, on painter rings, on the flag sockets, even on this boat, it says rushed an Indian girl on the on the thwart. This is a picture of, of an original rushed an Indian girl stem band from a canoe that Steve Lappy was working on. Now, I don't know how Rushton stamped it in there originally, whether he had one big stamp with the entire word on that they hit with a hammer or whether they had some mechanical or hydraulic press. So I wanted to try to put Rushton on the uh, on the stem bands. Now this boat, when I got it, did not have stem bands. They were long gone, so I, I made new ones. Now, I, I went on uh, eBay and I bought a set of uh, stamps of the proper font. And I think it's about the right size. It might a little bit be a little bit big, but in any case, it's the right font. But I wasn't sure how to do it on these stem bands to get the lettering all nice and straight. And what I ended up doing was, as you can see, I took the stem band and screwed it to a block of wood. And then I made another little block that goes on the back and that all clamped on there. That way I could take the, the stamp and put it on here. And uh, that way it would uh, be in alignment front to back or top to bottom. And uh, I would only have to worry about the spacing in between the letters. So that's what I did. And see, I clamped it all together in a vise and one letter at a time, I set it on there and tagged it pretty good with the hammer and made a nice uh, impression. And it seemed to come out pretty good. I uh, actually put a little, filed a little flat spot on top of the stem band before I started and I practiced on a piece of scrap. You know, I filed the flat spot on the top because the stem band, of course, is, uh, is round and uh, the letter the lettering if it wasn't a flat spot here wouldn't uh, would only show a little bit in the center these are my stem bands completed with the exception of polishing them up all right let's talk about paint for a few minutes um on these old hundred year old boats i don't think it looks right if they are super glossy so on the interior I painted it with Epiphanes, Epiphanes, um, matte finish. On the exterior, it is uh, Kirby paint. The Epiphanes, they recommend that you paint several coats with their gloss paint, gloss varnish, and then finish up with a couple coats of the matte, which is what I did. It's got four coats of gloss and two coats of the matte. On the exterior, the Kirby paint, uh, Kirby's gloss paint is not nearly as glossy as other brands of paint. And um, that's, that's why we, we, we chose that. Um, between the white and the blue, I used this fine line tape. This is made by Scotch. And uh, I bought it from Jamestown Distributors. I'm sure you can get it other places too, but it, it does work quite nicely. It comes in different widths. This is the half inch width. And with 20-20 hindsight, I probably should have gone with a little bit narrower width than it would have bent. It formed around the curve a little easier, but, uh, but it did work. Now, these are two, two custom colors from Kirby. This is an off-white, um, as opposed to the bright white, like he's on that canoe behind me and a, a custom blue. Kirby's real good and real nice about mixing up any color you want. So if you don't like the color 
any of the colors that are in their uh, uh, catalog, in their uh, color chart. They'll mix up whatever you want. We sent them a couple chips of what we liked and they mixed it up no problem. Um, this is the Kirby paint. The pinstriping and the lettering was done by a guy by the name of Jim Halpin. He's a professional uh, pinstriper guy um, in Dutchess County, New York. Uh, he usually works on hot rods, fire trucks, and uh, motorcycles. Um, the canoes that he's done for me, I'm the only guy that he ever did a canoe for. He's done six boats for me over the years, um, and uh, he's always done a beautiful job. Personally, I think um, unless it's done, the pinstriping and the lettering is done really well, it doesn't look right. So I leave it up to, to him to do it. I drink too much coffee and uh, I don't have the artistic talent. I, I, I can't do it, so I, he does it for me and it always comes out beautiful. I should have mentioned regarding the paint that I use the roll and tip method. You put the paint on with a four inch roller and then you tip it. This is a two inch, uh, two inch uh, badger brush that I got from uh, Jamestown, I think. Um, you do a short section at a time, maybe 18 inches at the most, and uh, roll it on and, and brush it out to uh, smooth out the, uh, take out the bubbles and to level things out. And it, it does work quite well. Uh, on the forums, the WCHA forums, there's any number of threads talking about paint and how to put it on, and so I'm not going to get into uh, details on that. It's easy to find a lively discussions about paint. I'm almost done with this boat. I still have to do the, still have to install the deck hardware and put the stem bands on, and uh, then I'd be done. So the old girl is finished, all done, back together again. I thank everyone for, uh, for watching. Those of you who have never restored a canoe before, I hope you got something out of it. You know, a tip or two and some inspiration. And those of you who have restored many canoes, I hope you weren't too bored and fell asleep. Like I've heard many times, when people find out what's really important in life, there's gonna be a shortage of wooden canoes. Battles up!